Welcome to the 2021 Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Before we begin, um, I want to reference the anti-harassment policy in the chat box. Um, so please go ahead and take a minute to look at that. Uh, we're going to begin with introductions. My name is Chantal Acevedo. I'm the author of Muse Squad, The Cassandra Curse, and Muse Squad, The Mystery of the Tenth. And I am so happy to be your moderator today for this fantastical, magical panel. So we're gonna, I'm going to begin with some introductions, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to tell us a little bit about their books. So we'll go in alphabetical order. And first is Olivia Abtahi. Olivia is a writer and filmmaker born in Washington, D.C. When she is in drafting novels about awkward teens, you can find her working on documentaries about social justice and climate equity. She currently lives in Denver, Colorado with her husband and daughter. According to Olivia's senior year bassoon teacher, she was, quote, the worst first chair bassoonist in Northern Virginia. Congratulations, Olivia. <laughs> Carlos Hernandez has published more than 30 works for fiction, poetry, and drama, including Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, for which he won a Pura del Pre Author Award from the American Library Association, and its sequel, Sal and Gabby Fix the Universe. He is an English professor at City University of New York, and he loves to play, uh, to both play games and design them. He lives with his wife, Claire, in Queens, New York, and you can follow him on Twitter at Write, Teach, Play. So welcome, Carlos. Uh, Next up, we have Victor Pinero. Victor is a creative director and content strategist who's managed YouTube and launched Skittles, uh, launched at Skittles, creating its award-winning zany voice. He's also designed games for Hasbro, written, produced a documentary on virtual worlds, and taught third graders. Time Villains is his first novel. Hey, Victor. And finally, Kayla Rivera still believes in the folk tales of her Mexican American and British parents, but now she writes about them from the adventure filled mountains of the Wild West. When she's not crafting stories, she's using her English degree from BYU as an editor for a marketing company or secretly doodling her characters in the margins of her notebook. Her debut novel, Cece Rios and the Desert of Souls came out this past April, uh, 2021. So welcome Kayla. And congrats to you all on your beautiful books. And I know everyone's eager to learn more about them. So maybe we can go around the room and we'll just do alphabet alphabetical order this one more time. And you can tell us um, about your books. That means Olivia's first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Olivia Tahi. I, um, the, I'm the author of Perfectly Paravine, which came out this May, and um, Rostam and the Red Dwarf, which is not out yet, but will be coming out soon, hopefully. Um, it is based on the Shahnameh, or the Persian Book of Kings, and it follows um, Rostam Zamini as he learns about uh, where he comes from um, on a new exoplanet within the Milky Way. So um, it's just a really fun reimagining of a really... Uh, I would say primal um, story to my Iranian culture. And it's also really interesting because it's got kind of a Latinx twist because Rastam, like me, is Middle Eastern and South American. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Shahnameh in space is what I'm calling it. <laughs> awesome, Olivia. Um, I guess I'll go next, alphabetically it's me. So um, I'm, I'm the author of, as I mentioned before, Muse Squad, The Cassandra Curse, and Muse Squad, The Mystery of the Tenth, which came out this summer. And it tells the story of Callie Martinez Silva, who is a Cuban American, 11 uh, year old girl who lives in Miami. And she discovers that she's one of the nine muses of Greek myth. And so she has to learn how to use her powers, how to get along with the other muses, and also protect other people around her who require inspiration, who are fated to save the world, quite possibly. Uh, so, book one set in Miami, book two in New York, and they were so much fun to write. So I think I am next. And first of all, I just want to say, I got to hear a little bit about the book yesterday, Chantel. It sounds so good. It's such a good premise. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, it's just really, really great. Um, I also got to hear Victor, uh, the person after me, at, at a reading that we did at an ice cream parlor in New York. And so there's just so many great treasures here. I just want to say I'm very glad to be here. So my books, uh, Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, and its sequel, Sal and Gabby Fix the Universe, 
but spoiler, they just break it some more. Uh, they, they're both about uh, Sal Vidon and uh, Gabby Real. And so Sal comes into the story being able to peek into and occasionally steal from other universes. So it's a many worlds uh, kind of story. Uh, there, there's actually even a, a long short story in an anthology that just came out uh, called The Cursed Carnival and Other Calamities that features Sal and Gabby as well. It's called Calamity Juice. And we learn a little bit more about where this fabled uh, particle that I totally made up called the Calamitron uh, comes from. And I'll give you a slight spoiler. It has to do with unicorns. It's a zany like exploration, uh, wild science kind of book that really is much more about sort of like two things, family and it's, it's an allegory of the scientific method and hopefully lots and lots of jokes. <laughs> and it's so good. I love those books. Um, and you have to watch Carlos read it sometime. That was an incredible experience. Um, hi, I'm Victor and I wrote the book. I was gonna try to not look when I got it, but uh, called Time Villains. It's the first in a series. Uh, the first one came out this July. And Time Villains is based around the question or inspired by the question, uh, if you could invite any three people to dinner, living or dead, who would they be? So I've always loved that question. So the idea is there's a magical object that allows our hero, Javi Santiago, uh, to do that. And he and his friends don't realize the power that this object has. So they invite, you could probably guess from the cover, they invite the worst villain of all time. So uh, each of these books kind of explores a new um, crazy guest. And and uh, once they invite this, this very terrifying villain into their world, they then start realizing that there's something suspicious about their school and there might be a way for them to find help with other characters from history or fiction. That sounds so cool. I'm so excited. And I'm jealous of the ice, ice cream parlor, frankly. I want to go. <laughs> but hola, everybody. I'm Kayla Rivera. Uh, I'm the author of Cicirios in the Desert of Souls. It's my debut novel. came out in April. Uh, and it is about Cicirios, who is a 12-year-old girl who's growing up in a magical world of Tierra del Sol. Um, and she has to become brave. She's kind of a scaredy cat at first, but she has to become brave and become a bruja in order to go and rescue her older sister who was kidnapped by the evil El Sombrerón. So there's lots of folklore, there's lots of ghouls and spooks, and there's even coyotes, so some shift, say, shape-shifting criaturas around. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's fun, I had fun. <laughs> Uh, and it is so fun. I had the sort of the great honor of being able to read your books and they're just all so fantastical and enjoyable and just great escapes and also fantastic lessons to be learned in there too, right? So thank you for your books. But, you know, we'll start with you, Kayla and Cece. And, and this is a question for everyone, but I'll ask Kayla to answer it first. Um, since our books, this panel is about fantasy and, and magic in books. My question is about your own sort of childhood and did you grow up with a sense of magic? Did you, um, were there sort of stories that were told in your family that were magical? Um, and how is that, or did any of that creep into your books? And it's okay if the answer is like, absolutely not. I found it in adulthood, you know, and I, and I went with it and that's a good answer too, but I'm just wondering what that was like for all of you. So maybe we can start with you, Kayla. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm half Mexican, so I didn't actually grow up with many stories of Mexican culture and folklore. That part I sort of discovered as I got older and started really reaching out for that half of my heritage. Um, but I definitely was like a magical little troll as a child. Like <laughs> I absolutely loved going out into the woods. Like I would pack, like I lived in Tennessee, so I like cut down my own bamboo and I like packed myself this little warrior pack and I'd go search into the woods for the unknown. I was always looking for something magical to show up, you know, and my mom is from England, of course. So whenever I went and visited um, England, my nanny, like she has like all of these statues full of fairies and like their backyard was like the most magical place ever because like you can feel that Celtic energy in the air, you know, when you're there. And I was like, oh. This is where it's going to happen. This is when the unicorn's going to find me, you know? <laughs> so that was definitely always a really strong part of, of my experience growing up. And I was really excited once I sat down and wrote CC to like bring that half of me to like the Mexican folklore part of me. <laughs> Yeah, two really strong magical backgrounds, like really rich with magic. I think it's that's very cool. How about you, Carlos? So um, 
uh, my sister just, uh, she read a poem that I had written a few years ago for Uncanny Magazine that has the title, in lieu of the stories, my Santera Abuela should have told me herself this poem. And really it is an encapsulation of stories that I did hear and all the ones that I wish I had heard before uh, she, she passed on. But one of them was the story of how she was sick of my grandfather when they both lived in Cuba, going to the bars at night and you know not coming home till late and getting drunk and stuff. So she sent a chicken after him and, and imbued chicken. And now, now I say this, but all through my childhood, people would come from Cuba and they would visit my house and they would inevitably tell the same story over and over about how this angry, massive chicken chased my grandfather all the way back home. Grandfather certainly confirmed it. Grandma confirmed it. Like I have a lot of objective verification that this happened. And so to me, it's just like, I'm reminded of um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez who said, I didn't know I was writing magical realism. I'm a, I'm a journalist. I thought I was writing realism. And so that's what I had. I had, you know, I had my little, you know, American life with, with American logic and American experiments in my science class. And then I had this lived Spanish life that had, you know, killer chicken stories in it. Okay, well, that's really weird because my background is, is Cuban too. And my grandmother, the way I would answer this question would be that these were my grandmother's stories were always sort of magical. Often they were superstitions, right? And so there was a darkness to them, right? Like if you leave the rocking chair rocking, the youngest child in the family is going to croak, right? Like they were always like scary, you know? But I, she also had an animal chasing story that she told always but in her story i forget now why it happened but she was in her yard and this grasshopper started chasing her but it, as she told it the grasshopper was this large which is impossible right yep. but she swears she's like it was it was this big and it chased me and it would just and it just waited at the back door and every time i would come to the back door it would jump against the glass yeah the chicken was at the door the chicken like was like relentless see so here's the thing mm. is it a <laughs> That keeps getting told or is this just science and different people are reporting cryptozoological things we report Perhaps. you decide people i think so i think so and we've lost olivia there for a minute but you know hopefully you know she comes back to us maybe behind the scenes we maybe a scare maybe a grasshopper <laughs> or a chicken is yeah. chasing her <laughs> i love it though because we both come from a cuban tradition i, I now i really want to investigate this me too. We have to ask the other Cubans in our lives. How about you, Victor? Where's that, that sense of magic growing up? Very similar to what you guys are talking about. So for one, Kayla, I had the exact same thing where I, my dad was Air Force, so we moved around a lot. But I had this beautiful like five-year period, second to sixth grade in Texas, where it was all just walking into the woods all the time. Every house had a wardrobe that I was looking for Narnia. Every, you know, like every, every like, girl my age was Dorothy, like I was just constantly kind of searching for all of it. Um, so there was that aspect. I, uh, I spent my summers in Puerto Rico, so I'm Puerto Rican, and it very similar as well to what you guys are saying. There were no grasshoppers or chickens to speak of, just like an overarching sense of, it's like the coquis at night kind of lull you into this like hypnotic kind of, like there's that otherworldly aspect to it. So I feel like there was no, like, I did have one story as a kid that, like, it's not as interesting as a, as a chicken story, but definitely one night my brother and I were hanging out in our house, and a moth that was this big flew into our, our room, and uh, it flew in, no, flew into the kitchen where we were, and then it flew all around the house, we chased it all over the house, my parents weren't home that night for some reason, at that moment, and we chased it into a room, and it disappeared. We never found the moth again, and because the internet wasn't around, we didn't, nobody believed us that moths this big existed, it took, like, decades later to like say like no no look, this is a real thing that happened to us this was not you know so i wasn't chased by a chicken but that was the closest magical animal story yeah you know moths have good camouflage ability maybe it's still there maybe right. it's it. yes totally <laughs> <laughs> i just gotta point out that totally sounds like the black witch moth which is like super otherworldly so like yes. magic all over that spooky magic but magic <laughs> take the spooky magic <laughs> We're glad you're back, Olivia. We were a little bit worried that either a chicken or a grasshopper or a giant moth had gotten you. So, <laughs> I'm, we're glad you're safe. Um, and I don't know if you have an answer to this question. Was there sort of a magic sense of things in your childhood? 
Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, always. I feel like the movie Big Fish like really exemplified my childhood. My dad is from Iran. My mom is from Argentina. Um, they met because my mom was my dad's asylum officer when he was fleeing the country and my mom had just left a military dictatorship. And um, every story that I grew up with always just seemed larger than life, especially since, you know, my father's from a country I don't know if I'll ever get to visit, like, in my lifetime. Um, of all of that as something I, um, yeah, I, I, that's just how I grew up. And then, yeah, in just terms of um, Iranian folklore, just like the Shah Nameh, um, like just here's like, this is every photo I grew up with, like just incredible illustrations, Persian miniatures of the tale of Rostam and Sohrab or the villainous Zahak. Um, just all of these people are kind of in like the Iranian consciousness. And um, yeah, that's like kind of the oral storytelling that both of my parents' cultures really uh, passed down to me. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I have another question about sort of fantasy and magic. I was reading uh, this, I read this beautiful novel. Well, it's actually a horror novel. It's really scary, but beautiful too, by Stephen Graham Jones, Mapping the Interior. And it's sort of an upper YA uh, horror novel. And I actually taught it to my college students. Like we, we talked about this book and we, sh we talked about this interview that Stephen Graham Jones had done. And someone asked him, why is horror the best lens through which to view this story? And I won't tell you his answer just yet because I want to ask you, why is magic, why was magic or fantasy the best way to tell your story? And let's start with Victor. Ooh, that's an intimidating one. Okay, I think, for me, I think honestly, at some point, I don't know if we all experienced this. So at some point, I just got to a place where when I read a book, it had to be about something more that was happening kind of in the normal world. Like to me, I found all sorts of, you know, all sorts of literature fascinating in all sorts of different ways. But like, to me, to really hook me, a book had to have something just a little bit extra dipping into the magical world. Almost like Carlos was saying, you know, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez says like, oh, I didn't know it was magical realism. Like to me, like it had to have that element because that felt more real to me than just a book kind of about this or that. So when it came to write my book, um, Honestly, I think I was dipping back into my childhood and trying to figure out like what would what would kind of like help me express like the like epic magic over the top childhood I had in the woods. And and I think as I was dipping into that, I was trying to figure out, okay, this element over here, this element over here. And then when I had the idea for um an object that brought any people into our world, I thought, okay, here's an excuse I have to pick anybody from history or anybody from fiction and just throw them in my book and just have like like an action figure party like you would have when you were a kid, like bring all the different action figures from different places. So to me, the, the magic was kind of twofold. One was like that magical world that I felt like I lived in as a kid. And the other one was um, just having the best excuse to like research my favorite characters or the ones I hadn't researched yet before through my life and stick them all into a book. I love that. I love that. I'm such a historical fiction like nerd and it was my my adult works so all historical fiction. So forget about it. It pushed all of my buttons. So I loved it. Um, how about you, Olivia? I think because I um, work in the climate space and I see um, how like humans treat resources, um, I think magic was kind of the best for me because I'm a little jaded and I love science fiction fantasy even though um, my debut novel is contemporary, my uh, 2022 novel, All's Are on Fire, is also contemporary um, YA. Um, I was that kid reading Dune, you know, at like <laughs> when I was 10, just like geeking out about space. Um, so I think I needed magic for this because I want to see what it would Earth. Um, and in... Uh, my middle grade novel, Rostam and the Red Dwarf, um, you have uh, humans who've enslaved jinn. And instead of wishing for gold or jewels, you have people wishing to take them to other planets so they can find the golden jewels there themselves. Um, I think I had to do it that way because I'm seeing the space race now and I, I, I can't really like imagine our current technology getting there, but what would it look like if humans had magic and how would we use magic in kind of like a bad way? So, um, it's something that has been helping me deal with, um, I think, the news and the world out there, just um, taking a hard look at how we manage things, um, but also how we can turn things around and be um, better than we were before and how there's always room to grow and improve. So I think I need
um, and restore it in a way and, and things. I think we missed the very last thing you said because you cut out. Oh gosh, yeah. I was just saying, sorry y'all, we're getting a snowstorm. Oh, so no. um, oh. I think something's happening here in Denver. Um, <laughs> but I was, I was just saying that I kind of yeah. needed magic to restore my own faith in humanity. <laughs> there we go. No, yeah, we, we missed the last sentence. So, oh, that's, that's a beautiful last sentence. Well, good luck with the snow. You know, I'm in Miami, so it just, I would be thrilled to be Tough life. there, you know, with all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would say that like for me, for, for my books, that the, the, the idea of setting it in a magical world in a fantastical world, part of it is, is conceptual because the idea for Muse Squad came, I was at a museum, which is, they're named after muses. And I was looking at a bust of a muse and I thought out of nowhere, what if they'd been children? And then I immediately started like tapping into my phone, sort of who these characters might be. And then I had, I really had a choice. I could have set it in the in sort of in, in classical Greece, right? And they could have been toga wearing, you know, muses. Um, but I thought it was so much more interesting to think of them as Miami, you know, like a kid in Miami. Like, what does that mean in the modern world? Like how do the muses function today? And so the only way to do that is through magic, of course. And um, some Victor mentioned earlier in, when I asked about sort of a sense of magic in your childhood, you were always looking for like magical spaces and things like this. And I was like such a sucker for portal stories as a kid. like. I was convinced that there were there was something in all the wardrobes, right? And so it's it's a portal story too, just because I like them so much, you know. So yeah, I, I can't imagine musical art in any other form, you know, than middle grade and magic, you know. Um, how about how about you, Kayla? Somehow I just blanked. Can you re ask me the question? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I should I should have been re asked. Re it's late, isn't it? I was just um, thinking about how much I like New Squad and then I was like, oh. oh okay. well, thank you. Well, the the question is why how is fantasy or magic? Why is it like the best form for your story? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of the story in CC centers around the fact that the criaturas have souls outside of their bodies. And so a lot of the story revolves around how do we treat each other and like what's the appropriate way to treat each other, like consent and avoiding abuse and what abuse looks like and all those different kinds of things. And I think it'd be a very overwhelming story if it wasn't for the magic. I wanted to explore those things, but in an approachable way that didn't make you be like, oh, now I have to live really close to all of this subject matter for the next few days, you know, <laughs> in like a hopeless way. And I wanted to explore it in a way that was like really centered and like really woven into the DNA of the world. Uh, and I found that having souls on the outside was a really, really good way of exploring that in an approachable way. Uh, I mean, it makes you ask so many questions, right? Like, would you take better care of people if you could touch their soul and know how they were feeling? Or would you use that against them? You know, because we do kind of do that in real life, you know, the way that we interact with each other is based on, you know, facial cues or the way that when somebody tells you you hurt their feelings and things like that. And we see how we react in so many different ways that way. But to see how a direct impact with souls would affect things. I don't know. It was just kind of like what Victor said. I wasn't interested in most things growing up, like if they weren't some fantasy element. I was like, OK. This is a cool contemporary book, but like, what if there was witches? <laughs> now I'm sold. <laughs> so I feel like one, I have lots of real life things I want to explore, real life feelings, ideas, but it's once I divorce it from the way that it's always looked at in real life with the new lens of fantasy, it almost allows me to engage with it more fully because I'm no longer carrying the way that I've labeled everything in real life. You know, where I'm like, oh, I have opinions on that. But now that you're in a new world, you have a new opportunity to engage with all the same subject matters and all the same feelings, but so much more opportunity, you know? I guess that's why I thought, like, I can't imagine, like you said about Me Squad, I can't really imagine CC in another way. Like, it kind of needed to be in this completely another world with souls on the outside that was made from words, you know, things like that. <laughs> Those what ifs are so so much more fun when they're magical too because it just everything's blown open right anything's possible yeah how about you carlos i have so many answers to this question i'm going to try not to go on for 62 minutes but uh a couple of things that came up that what if i think is really important for a couple of things because reality is really messy 
you know, and what I think magic allows us to do is sort of like cut to the chase to what's actually important, you know? Because, you know, if we if we say you can just do this and it's magic, now we can remove all the dross of reality and all the slow pondering we have to do to get from point A to point B and just get to the good stuff. So I think there is a kind of like uh, narrative exigency that happens when you have a magic system that just lets you sort of like bypass the things that are not as entertaining. So in, in game design, one of the things we talk about are well-ordered problems. A game is a very, very well-organized, well-ordered problem that presents information just when you need it, gives you just enough challenge to keep it interesting, but not too much that makes you want to quit. And so I think novels are also well-ordered problems and magic systems are one of the ordering principles that make it really entertaining. I also want to say that language, our language right now in this world is pure magic. Like this is our actual magic system in this world. So anytime any writer is engaged in using language uh, to create a story, they are engaged in, a, in an act of fabulation. And that to me, I just think we fantasy and science fiction writers, we're just more honest about what we do. You know, those, those realists, with their third person omniscient. I mean, is there anything more magical in the universe than third person omniscient? I can jump into every single person's head and know exactly what they're thinking and feeling and can say it in a few words so that you know exactly what, nonsense. It is nonsense. See, we fantasy writers, we're, we're the honest ones. <laughs> right, that, that godlike voice. What is that? The, the arrogance. <laughs> Good, I'm so good. These are such good answers. And let me tell you what um, Stephen Graham Jones said when asked, why is horror the perfect vase in which to pour your story? And he said, because it's fun. <laughs> and that was sort of the end. That was it. That was it. I was, it was a setup, but it was such a delightful because it was a very, very serious interview. And that answer just came out of, felt like it came out of left field, right? But sometimes... The answer is fun. And truly, all of your books are so fun, right? And part of what makes them fun is that magic, the fantasy, right? The possibilities and the what ifs. Um, so I think that's valid too. Um, but speaking of what makes your books fun, it's your main characters are also delightful. So I have a question about them. And so let's play a little what if with them. What if you could bring your main character into your world, right? Through a portal, let's say a wardrobe, whatever kind of portal floats your boat, and you've brought them into your world, where would you take them to hang out and why? And let's start with Kayla. Okay, I have the perfect answer to this. I would 100% take Cece to a beach for a day. You know, maybe even a week. I don't know. It depends on how long she can stay there, whether the portal can stay open. I don't know. <laughs> but I would definitely take Cece to the beach because, uh, well, I guess it will make more sense if you read the book. <laughs> but there's a very good reason. Uh, Cece's never been to the ocean. She's always grown up in the desert. And everybody tells her she has a water soul. And that that's a bad thing in the desert. Um, but I'd love to take her to see the ocean and to have just a nice peaceful day where she gets to enjoy the water and all of the expansive sounds of it all and really connect with uh, her water soul. <laughs> awesome. I, I would like to join her at the beach as well. How about Olivia? Um, if I could take uh, Rostam Zamini anywhere, um, well, first of all, he'd be on planet Earth, which would just like blow his mind, even though he was born on Earth. Um, maybe it's because I'm the daughter of like refugees, you know, his his mom's had to flee. So he's returning to Earth after a long time. Um, but he wants to be um, a spacecraft pilot. So I would take him. Um, my dad's a pilot. I would take him to the little airstrip that I grew up um, going to like every day after school with my dad. Um where basically he, you know, as a airplane mechanic, he'd be like, all right, let's take her up and see what's wrong with her. And I'm like, cool, great. I'm going to go up in a busted plane, like with the bad squawk box or something. So um, I would definitely take him up into like a little Cessna or a Cherokee and let him like steer with like, you know, you have like these old school yokes, right? You know, in the future, it's all like sleek dashes and stuff, but this will just be like a Ricky tin can in the sky. Oh, nice. I love how active that is, too. Yeah. How about you, Carlos? Or would you take Sal and Gabby? I mean, I would have to take Sal immediately to Miami, Florida, because we would have to know what the difference is between my universe and 
his home universe is because that's what he does in every single universe. You know, he's on a constant quest to a uh, see if in this universe, there's a version of his mommy that he wants to get to know a little better and B he wants to be sure to avoid the chicken factory. That is the cause of great woe in both books. Those, ch those chickens, man, they they haunt you. Yeah, they do. <laughs> They've been there since the beginning. <laughs> How about you, Victor? Where would you take your, your character? I don't know if we'd go anywhere special. So two things about Javi. One is that he is this amazing chef who does a lot of like Puerto Rican American fusion, like very quirky. Probably have him cook for me. Uh, and then I think, you know, if he brings this object along, I think we'd have like a really nice long conversation. We're like, all right, who are we gonna invite? Who are we gonna bring? We get we get anyone in the world who's coming with you. So I think that would be a lot of the day. And then hoping that the people we invite don't wreak havoc on the earth and we survive. I mean, it's very generous of you to let them make that choice, considering the, how those choices usually go. <laughs> <What are you talking? laughs> it's very, very, very courageous of you. Um, I, it, it struck me even after now that I've after I wrote this question for you all to answer. And now I've thought about it and I realize that I don't have a good answer myself. And and partly it's because because I wrote a portal story, I got to take Callie everywhere. And in book two, I got to take her to New York, which was a new city for her to explore. And so I was already kind of doing this in my imagination. Um, I'm sure she'd be very happy to give Sal a tour around Miami. Um, but perhaps I'd take her to Chicago since Muse headquarters are always museums. I think um, the Field Museum is one of my favorites. And I'm not gonna write a Muse Squad 3, but if I had the chance to write a Muse Squad 3, I would definitely set it there. So I think I would take her there and put it out in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I like that question, so I'm, I'm glad you all had fun with it, too. Um, can I ask a little bit about sort of the challenges of writing these magical, fantastical settings? What were some of the, what was the biggest challenges? And then what is, what's the biggest, what, what were some of the biggest joys of writing it? What were those discoveries like for you? So maybe we can start with Olivia. Um, for me, one of the biggest challenges is just the logistics of space. I am not Andy Weir. This is not The Martian. I cannot get into such a granular level of how to pull off a space book like that. But, um, you know, I, I read a lot of books about space. So it was fun, you know, kind of like setting those parameters for myself. Um, I think a fun part for me in terms of just like building this magical world was that um, NASA and other like astronomical organizations will take the mythology of um, a story and put it on a planet for their naming system. So for like Enceladus, it's um, the story of Scheherazade's rock number one, ocean number two. They actually have like craters and oceans named after characters. So um, that was just like a fun discovery. And so um, it's really nice to take the Charname and put it onto like a new planet that they've discovered and see what kind of naming systems um, they'll be using next. So that was just like a fun um, moment of kismet for me in terms of the world building, for sure. Very cool. I love that. How about um, how about you, Victor? I think the uh, you know the challenge and the joy was you know I think you know a lot of times in writing and creating anything you talk about how limits are the most powerful thing you can have because the less limits you have, the harder it is to make decisions and kind of operate something. So to me, I think. Once the idea came and I said, okay, I can invite anybody, anybody from history or fiction, it was that. It was, okay, it's everybody. So <laughs> I think it was really narrowing it down and trying to figure out, okay, who do I want to invite? How do I want to structure the book? And it was funny because, um, you know, so the, the villain is obviously Blackbeard in this. I am not a pirates guy. I've never liked pirates my entire life. But when I was researching worst villains in history and fiction and everything, his specific character is so fascinating that it just, it gave me like this whole little portal to jump into. And all of a sudden I became this pirate buff for like the next couple of years because it was so fascinating. So I, I love when things do that. Um, and on the flip side, the greatest joy of course was the same thing was that I had an excuse to do research. And I, like most of us, I'm sure I'm a huge nerd. And like, I was like, oh, who, does, who do I get the excuse to read all about today? So, you know, I got a chance to read a lot of old dusty books that I've wanted to read and, you know, dive in deep Wikipedia rabbit holes and all sorts of other esoteric places. So, yeah. Yeah. So research is so much fun. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Carlos. Yeah. So for me, it, it's very similar, I think, to the answer. So this is kind of like variations on the theme. When you create something and you just kind of lean back in your chair, it's like, <laughs> Okay, that's pretty funny. You know, like those moments are great. And, you know, when you just write a sentence that, you know, like somebody's going to smile at, 
that's that's great stuff. So that that those those little moments of invention I love, but they are also the things that get you because I don't know if you all are Scrivener writers and you have these beautiful laid out, you know, I have every character study and here's a world map and here is a family tree. No, no, no. That's not how I do it. I just reread, you know, what I've done. And so like, I'm always like, oh my God, what did I say on page 162? Why, why did I agree to write a sequel? What What is this, you know, this this madness that I've created for myself? So it's definitely like the the keeping track of everything that you said and being consistent that uh, it, it is the hardest part uh, for me. Of course, you know, it's what you said, Victor, about limits, that, that that's where the joys come from. Uh, but there's also one other thing. The hardest thing about middle grade is that middle grade readers are just as deep and interesting readers as adults are, but they have time to reread and they will memorize your books and know everything that you've said better than you did, especially like when you wrote it like two years ago and you've been trying to work on a different project. So you middle grade authors out there present or coming, just be ready for the quiz of your lifetime when you show up at a school and somebody's like, uh, on page 86, you know, and you're like, page 86? What did I say on page 86? Absolutely. That's when you start to feel like uh, William Shatner at a Star Trek convention, right? Like, like they know their stuff. <laughs> all right, Kayla, go ahead. Well, first of all, I totally appreciate like the the chaos, like the chaotic good energy, Carlos, because that's definitely me with my own books. You know? <laughs> and that was probably the hardest thing. Um, I picked a very really kind of strange like setting. Well, not strange, unusual, not done a lot uh, setting for CC because it's like an alternate fantasy world but it's based on Mexico in the 1920s to 30s so there was all kinds of weird things I had to start researching you know once I got an editor and they're asking me like the real questions so I'm like I need to go find out I will let you know <laughs> so I found out all kinds of amazing things about Mexico in the 1920s to 30s like about how no there weren't hardly any cars there even though cars were invented they just barely had any there, you know? Actually, most of the world didn't have them outside of Germany and the United States. Fun fact, I know that now. <laughs> uh, electricity, hardly anywhere either. Um, I also know a lot, a weird amount about Mexican geology now because there's a mine in the book for like one page. And now I had to research everything just to make sure I had like the right rock. <laughs> so nope. all kinds of things, yeah. <laughs> So many weird research things. I also know that like, yeah, hawks eat chickens. That was just for a chapter title. <laughs> so I got all kinds of fun things like that. I know, but I also really, really enjoyed like some of the extra richness that doing that research did. Cause sometimes you come across stuff that you're like, I have a cool idea for that now. I was just fact checking, but now I'm going to make that a thing. Like um, there's different stones used in CC to mark the different kinds of gods. And like, they're all chosen for a reason. Like uh, there's, a, there's a stone, like there's a, a diamond of jade in the center of a mural with all the gods because jade in ancient Mesoamerica was the stone of the gods that represented both life and death. And I was like, ah, nobody knows that, but I do. <laughs> So I got to do all kinds of little things that make it nice and rich if you look into it. So, you know, I will probably totally lose to all of the middle grade students who read CC and be like, well, you said here when the second one comes out. And I'd be like, you're very careful. And I appreciate that. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully they'll pick out the cool things that I did on purpose, too. <laughs> Yes, I love that this question also, for most of you, all of you, I think, turned into a question also about research, which is always so interesting. So thank you for that. But we now are getting to the best part of this panel, which is when the kids ask us questions. So we've got three wonderful questions. And so I think we are ready to hear from Dolly A in ninth grade, and she's in California. How do you feel about the first draft of your book? It's a big question, Dally. <laughs> so, so who wants to take Dally's wonderful question? 
I mean, I guess I'll start. Um, so <laughs> I'm in love with my first draft of every book I write, you know, like completely dazzlingly in love with it in like uh, the way that only being in love makes you blind to something's faults. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's a mess, but I love it. <laughs> Um, and the more that I write, the more I'm able to see all of those problems from the get go. But I still have that honeymoon phase for about like a week after I finish my first draft because it's the most raw fun I have is that first draft. After that point, when I go into the revisions and then I have to like actually find answers to questions and resolve issues in it, then I'm like, oh, man, this is the hard work of loving something. <laughs> But the first draft is like a little honeymoon phase for me. And then I have to buckle down into reality and be like, okay, but it, it's a hot mess, actually. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Does anyone else want to answer this one? I'll just say that first draft mm -hmm. to me, I always, when I hear somebody talk about that, I get excited because like, I, I want to save you a decade if you want to write a book. And it took me an extra decade to write a book because I did two things that I didn't know about. One is not to plot, like Carlos was saying, you don't have to plot everything in advance and plan everything and have like a thousand different folders full of everyone's backstory. I thought you did, that, that wasted a lot of time in my life. <laughs> Secondly, I think that it's really important, not for everybody, but kind of like Kayla was saying, like to me, first draft, let it be very messy and let it be really fun and don't even think about any of it. Just write, 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 write and see what you have at the end. Like not everyone is right that way, but if you're like me and a lot of authors I know, that will help you write the first book a lot faster, I think. Yeah, Dali, I, I was not laughing at you. I was laughing at the question because how do I feel about my first draft? Usually terrible. Like I usually don't feel great, but um, to Victor's point, done is better than perfect every time. Getting that first draft done is such a huge accomplishment. Even if I don't feel great about it, yes, I will go by myself an ice cream cone after because I deserve it. And I finished, I finished my draft. So um, yeah, I like just echoing Kayla and Victor again. Um, mm -hmm. It's not perfect and that's okay. And you just have to be, um, you know, gracious with yourself right now. We're in, um, you know, uh, November, there's NaNoWriMo as well that comes up. And that's how a lot of folks get started where they just say, hey, just write 50,000 words. And by you know the end of this month, you will have a book. And I think that's really great. So just always keep going. Even if those words aren't perfect, um, getting them out there is more important. Yeah. I just want to jump in very quickly and say the way I avoid uh, first draft angst is I don't write first drafts. See, I cheat all the way through. And what I do is I have the spiral technique where I'll write chapter one and they'll go a little tiny chapters to be like, oh, yeah, so let me go ahead and fix this. Bit in. And so then I'll go about midway chapter to be like, oh, yeah. And then I can like circle back. And so by the time I'm done, I have about 152 drafts, you know, and that that basically solves the problem. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Dolly, for your question. Let's hear from another another kid. Nora in the fifth grade in Alabama. Let's hear it, Nora. In a sequel, how do you set up the characters in an entertaining way for people who haven't read the first book? Nora, you're so cute. <laughs> and I want to answer your question. Um, for the second Muse Squad, I... You, what, what I my technique was to try to recap things in a really organic way in the beginning, right? So you have um, maybe the characters talking about what happened last time and you say it in a way that kind of catches everybody up. But you can't do it sort of like really obviously or over the head because then that's awkward. So you have to kind of make it part of the story. So it was tricky. And I would say that was one of the, that's one of the trickiest things about writing sequels. What a good question. Um, who else wants to take this one? I'll just say that I'm writing my sequel right now. So, you know, <laughs> learning right now. I don't have a specific advice other than just trying to remind everybody, give something to grab onto with each character. And like from the beginning, just like you do in the first one, setting up a um, like, hey, here's an implied character arc coming. So, <laughs> but working on it myself. 
Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, I'll, I'll just say that basically I knew I had to have all this information. And what I did is I made sure I didn't put it in the same order that I did in the first book. So I, I was like, okay, so I have all these different things that happen in the book that I have to mention, but if I do them in the same order, it's going to feel, I think like Chantelle, you were saying it, like it's, it's just, you're doing it too obviously. And so yeah. definitely putting it in the same order and starting with a different plot point uh, was one very specific technique that I used. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, it's super tricky. Like the sequels are the the the, the scariest bit. And I remember my um, editor in sort of my drafts of my first book asking, this gets resolved in the second book, yes. And like being sent in a panic, like, oh, okay, yes, even though I hadn't quite figured it out, <laughs> but promising that I would figure it out. Um, we have one more question and it's from, um, Zavi in the seventh grade from Massachusetts. And I'm going to read this one to you because it's not a video. And so that question is a very simple one, but I think also sometimes complicated to answer. How hard is it to write a book? So Zavi's getting to the root of the matter. What do we all feel? How hard is it to write a book? Who wants to take this one? I think once you get into it, I think because I dreaded it for a long time, I thought it was the hardest thing in the world. And then when I actually did it and looked back, I said, you know, that was a lot more joy and a lot less angst than I thought. Um, so I think a couple things there. One is be prepared to like it. <laughs> you might actually find that you just enjoy doing it. And the more you do it, the more you enjoy it. It's not, it doesn't get easier, I don't think. But I think you learn to find the joy in it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think it's obviously you can make it the hardest thing in the world. But you can also just make it kind of this interesting, fascinating little time you have to yourself. That you get to jump into your world and kind of create all the interesting things you want and just have a great time with it. Yeah. I think for me, I was coming from a film world. So just to have an idea out there, I had to convince people the idea was worth it. Then I had to hire people to make the idea happen. I had to get distribution for the idea. Um, all of these different pieces had to come together. And so when I started writing novels, I was like, oh, it's just me. Um, and so it was easier in the sense that like logistically, um, I just needed a word processor or even just like a pen and paper. But on the other hand, if my book is bad, I have only myself to blame. So I think that's harder in a sense. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I, you know, I touched on this before, but just writing a little bit each day, like then you get a book, even if you're only writing 50 mm -hmm. words a day, um, you know, one word a day, it's like, you can still like get to that point. It'll take a long time, but um, it does add up. So um, I always encourage young folks, if you're interested in writing a book, um, just start small. And um, it's kind of like gardening. You just see that seed grow and grow and grow. You just need to give it water and tender love and care and just, um, you know, really attend to it. So um, it may seem daunting, but I promise if you are already watching this panel and you're already interested in books, then um, it kind of sounds like maybe it's time for you to start writing one too. I also want to say books don't have to be long. You fold four sheets of paper together. One's the cover, one's the credits, and then you've mm -hmm. got a couple pages in there. Like, make a book, like tonight. Make a little book for yourself. Books are great. It's so one of the things I do in creative writing class. We end up with like little chapbooks, you know, of different work that we've done so that people can collect it and feel like I've done a thing that wants to be read later and preserved. And that's what the beauty of a book is. So, how hard is it to write a book? I mean, I think all the answers are very true if you're thinking about like sort of like a novel length fantasy book or whatever. But also, you know, if you fold, you know, a piece of paper four times, cut it in a certain way and then open it up, you can have a little book almost instantly. And uh, mm -hmm. you should. It's also extremely pleasurable. Agreed on that. I have written like 10 books before CC or CC is the 10th. I've lost count a little bit. Um, but that's because I wrote tons of like little short um, picture books when I was a kid and I loved them even though like looking back I'm like yeah let's see if I was gonna actually publish that I might change some things you know <laughs> but at the time like it, it I enjoyed it and that's all that mattered I read it to my family and I enjoyed it um, so I guess how hard is it to write a book my take on it would be kind of depends on what you want out of the book mm. you want something to enjoy for yourself it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be like this slog but if you do want to get published one day and you want to write a really like write well a really good book for lots of people to enjoy 
that one's harder. <laughs> that one takes a lot more work and a lot more plowing yeah. through and addressing yeah. the stuff that you're like, I don't care, but you have to have an answer for it. <laughs> I love it, Kayla. Thank you so much. And Javi, this is such a good question. And the truth is, you can have lots of fun and sometimes it'll be hard, but hard things are worth doing. So we are so glad that you asked that question. And I am so glad that I got to spend this time with all of you, dear writers, you're amazing. Your characters are so lovable. Your books are phenomenal. And I want everyone out there to please go get these folks' wonderful books. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you for attending the 2021 Latinx Kid Lit Festival. This has been fantastic. Fantasy, magical stories, and middle grade. And we are out. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Chantel. You. Bye. Bye.